This week on TGC News, SIG is at the tip of the spear, an XD clone, Magpul's new stuff for 2022, and I'll break down what's going on with SHOT Show. Neomag has been supporting TGC for years, and I know you guys love what they do. You tell me all the time. Whether it's the classic Neomag, the Rask, Maybe you like the Sentry Strap and Scout Sling. Or maybe you like the EDC tray. They make some awesome gear. Now, normally we would tell you about a discount code, but in times like these, Neomag is putting their money where their mouth is. Here's a message straight from them. Hey everybody, if you go to our website and you place an order and use code TGC2A, we're gonna donate 10% of that order to the Firearms Policy Coalition. So we're doing this because we understand exactly how important this fight is. So let's all get together. Let's fight for our gun rights. That's right. Use code TGC2A over at theneomag.com to have 10% of your order donated to Firearms Policy Coalition. Now that is the kind of brand I can get behind. Welcome back to another episode of the Gun Collective News, the only gun news show that covers things you actually care about. My name is John Patton. Yeah, that's, that's my name. Today marks the start of SHOT Show in Las Vegas. Yesterday was range day. And we are already seeing a bunch of really interesting new stuff trickle out. We here at TGC are not attending the show this year. So our normal crazy schedule is not happening. There's not gonna be tons of videos this year, but we will absolutely still be paying attention to all the new and interesting stuff that comes out. And we'll update you guys as much as we can on Instagram and Facebook to uh, sort of see new stuff, so follow us over there. I guess we'll kick it off with a recall from FN. Yay, recall. There is a massive mandatory recall on the M249S rifles. All of them, in fact, it's not like a select amount. FN says that they identified an issue in the fire control group that may, quote, adversely affect the rifle's standard operation and under certain circumstances, a reset failure within the hammer group may cause an unsafe firing event. <laughs> that to me says it goes full auto, which is fun, but dangerous if it's not intentional. Go to FN's website if you are a baller and have one of those guns. Now, how about since it's the time of year when all kinds of new cool stuff comes out, we cover some of the new cool stuff. Savage has a new version of their impulse rifle called the Impulse Elite Precision. Long story short, they took the already super interesting straight pull bolt gun and dropped it into an MDT, they're a Canadian company, adjustable core competition chassis. This adds a full Arca rail under the front end and a few other nice features as well, like adjustable length of pull and comb height. Yeah, that's kind of standard, <laughs> it's at least in competition stuff. And it also has an AMB mag release, that's cool. In the promo video, they called this their newest long range tack driver, but I'm not seeing any sort of accuracy guarantee anywhere, so who knows what they really intend for that to mean. The gun can be had in seven different calibers from 308 to 338 Lapua, with barrel lengths from 26 to 30 inches on the big bores. And pricing goes from 2649 on the low end, like the 308, 65, up to 2849 for the Magnum calibers. I'm super interested to see how this compares in terms of accuracy to their normal precision guns. Like, is it gonna be better, or worse, different in any way? Also, uh, another quick note about the Savage Stance that we covered last week. As it turns out, that gun is very much a rehashed version of the now dead Honor Defense Honor Guard pistol. That gun originally came out in 2016, which points a lot to the design being really obsolete before it was launched from Savage. The Honor Guard was basically an MMP shield ripoff to begin with, so it's copying a copy. Yeah. A few of you guys pointed this out in the comments. You guys were like, hey, this is an Honor Guard. That's rad, I love it when you guys do that. And I wanted to let the rest of you guys that didn't see that know what's going on. So moving on, Sig Sauer has announced a commercial version of their MCX Spear Rifle chambered in the vaporware known as 277 SIG Fury. The spear is a result of the next-gen squad weapons program, and I'll be honest, it looks rad. It, it has a 13-inch barrel, SBR one up. 
It comes with the SLX 6.8 suppressor, two boxes of 277 Fury ammo, a non-reciprocating charging handle, a six position folding stock, which like nowadays is it's like saying that milk comes with white coloring. Of course, it's a six position stock. Like that's normal. And a couple other trinkets like a uh, two stage match trigger, two position gas piston system, and full ambi controls. So it appears that this is a two stamp gun because it's got the short barrel and comes with a can. As it turns out, I'm jealous of this. James Reeves from TFB has already shot the damn thing and I'm supremely jealous <laughs> because it's a machine gun version of that gun. Anyway, the price on this particular gun is $7,999 MSRP. Wait, 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 hold on. Did I win? Did I win? Is SIG finally putting MSRPs on their website? Nothing else says an MSRP listed, so I'll take this as a win anyway. Eight grand for this limited run rifle is a lot, but it's probably gonna be worth a ton in 20 years or so, and there's that aspect of it, I guess. Defense Distributed is back in the news this week with something to kick the ATF and anti-gunners directly in the nuts. Yay. <laughs> it's called the AR-0, and it's basically an update to their Ghost Gunner 3 machine that allows you to mill what they are calling 0% AR-15 unregistered, unserialized receivers. I'd like to point out that this is entirely legal. It's not illegal to do this and should not be viewed as something besides awesome because to my knowledge, this is the only company that has made this possible from the comfort of your own 3D printing CNC machining lair. There are a couple interesting bits to understand about this though. The part that you are machining is only part of what we know as an AR-15 lower. You machine that, it's sort of the upper lower, and then attach what they call a lower lower and buffer tower ring to the complete unit. I'm told that the machine is capable of machining everything, like an entire receiver, and a future update might allow you to do even more. You can buy the AR-15 non-receiver block from DD for 25 bucks, then the lower finishing kit for 85. And if you wanna upgrade your current Ghost Gunner 3 machine, there's a kit for 295 bucks to do that. So 405 bucks if you have a machine already or the standard pricing if you decide to get that kit when you sort of get your machine to begin with. Okay, sure. For me personally, even though this is not a true 0% build as we might like assume, it is the closest thing that we've got. And I think it's incredible to have a company pushing this way to get folks being self-sufficient, even if it isn't cheap to get started. Moving on from there, a company called BRG USA has a new pistol coming to market called the BRG9. It's an import from a Turkish company called Burgu Metal. And I'll be honest with you guys, it looks like an older Springfield, AKA HS product XD9 with a slightly different grip and trigger. It's a striker fire nine mil that comes with a four inch barrel, 16 round mags, slide serrations front and rear, ramp sights, a flat face trigger with a dingus, a grip safety, cue the anger over that part, <laughs> and a grip with light texture, light finger grooves, and adjustable back strap. The more I look at this, I keep like, I was like staring at this when I was writing this script. The more I see this XD that's been tweaked slightly. There are differences like the extractor on the BRG is exposed. The takedown pin isn't sticking through to the passenger side like it is on the XD. And of course the grip is a bit more rounded, but it's pretty damn close. That means that the BRG is an old design in new clothing. Think of it like an old celebrity that got Botox. The pricing on the BRG9 starts at $399 for the all black model and adds a few bucks for the two-tone and FDE version. Also in the news this week is Maxim Defense, who is most known for their ultra small SBRs and pistols. And they're coming out with something bigger called the MD colon 11. <laughs> Long story shorter, this is essentially an SR-25 AR-10 thing that's been treated like the other Maxim guns. It's chambered in either 6.5 Creed or 308 Winchester with an 18 inch proof research barrel in either carbon or stainless, your choice. There's also a 15 and a half inch M-lock handguard, carbine buffer tube, 
that is covered with a B5 Sop Mod stock and a Geisley SSA E trigger. It sounds like a pretty nice gun. When you, like, you're thinking about all that, that's a pretty nice gun. There's no pricing as of the writing of this episode, but I'm guessing it's going to land north of $2,500 or closer to three grand, especially with a proof barrel. It may even touch $3,500. I guess we'll have to wait and see. And rounding us out, <laughs> this is going to be a lot. The Magpul new products for 2022. They've got a whole bunch. They do this every year. There's a lot of them. And we're just going to go in the order that they have it listed. So forgive us if this sort of jumps around a bit. Okay, first is the MOE or Mo SLM stock, which is basically a small PDW style stock, but it's pretty affordable at 45 bucks MSRP. And then there are three new versions of the Tejas belt. El Chibolo, which is made from bison hide and goes for a buck twenty. El Delgado is a thinner bull hide belt that's slated to retail at ninety bucks. And then El Pistolero is a slightly like fancier version at one hundred and fifteen dollars. Rolling forward, they also have a new SL stock for the MP5 pattern rifles. This is a dual post style deployable stock and can be adjusted with one hand. You just kind of yank it out. Pricing here is $160. After that, we have the MOE Bipod, which is an all-polymer version of their prior bipods and is said to be lighter, but still strong. It could be cool for like maybe an ultra lightweight hunting build. I don't know, that makes sense there. Pricing there is 75 bucks compared to the 110 for their metal and polymer version. Keeping it moving, there is a new chassis called the Pro 700 Lite SA. This is meant to be a blend of their Pro 700 chassis and PRS light stock with less weight and still great features. They call it a streamlined version of the Pro 700, and it has a retail price of 600 bucks. They also have the DACA utility pouch, which is 30 bucks, and a Hunter American stock for the Ruger American short actions that takes Stanag mags, Stanag, whatever you want to, aka AR mags, on your Ruger American. That's priced at 300 bucks, which is about the same as the rifle itself. Then we have the DACA single pistol pouch at 40 bucks. It's a little pricey for a pistol pouch, but it's going to be a good one, and I believe they're waterproof. Also, a large size DACA can and a normal 2.0 can. I guess they're upgrading that. These are just different storage solutions to keep stuff clean and dry. They go for about 20, 25 bucks, depending on which one you want. Then we have arguably one of the best instances of an ejection port cover that I've seen. It's plastic and installs with zero tools pretty easily and it's 15 bucks. I love stuff like that. Easy, easy, easy. That's great. From there, more new DACA pouches under the DACA light line. So basically just lighter weight pouches. They go from 15 to 23, depending on size. There's three of them. And then a new Fight Glove 2.0, which goes for 60 bucks. And a partnership, this is one of the most interesting things, partnership with a company called Maztec, so Magpul and Maztec. They've come together to make a system called X4, which is basically like future soldier stuff, like monitoring this and that, you know, data up on a screen. And this is the first thing to come out from that. It's going to be an electronic round counter, and it's intended to show you on a display, either on or off the rifle, how many rounds are left in the mag. There's also this thing called FCS, or Fire Control System, which is basically a display unit that attaches to your low power variable optic. It's intended to show you range, ballistic data, round count, and rounds remaining, among some other things that are probably in development. Unfortunately for us, this whole thing is still in development and not out yet, but they do intend on this being commercially available which is freaking awesome. That's rad. I like, this is the future. We live here. And last but not least, an update on the FDC slash FDP9 collaboration that they are working on with Zevtech. They say that the FDP will be available to be purchased just like any other handgun, and the FDC will be an NFA item. You'll be able to convert your FDP if you want once you go through the NFA crap, and there's just like a simple part swap. They also said that they are well into the tooling phase and plan to release the guns in 2023. Hell yeah, I am still in for that. Also, I'm not wearing one, but go grab one of our shirts. TGC merch is always a great way to support us, so thanks for doing that. Wow, that, that was a ton of new stuff, as per usual, with this time of year. Sound off in the comments. 
with the things that you're most excited about that we've covered so far, there's going to be a lot more coming out this week. I want to hear directly from you guys on what matters to you. Just because I'm addicted to caffeine does not mean that I have to settle for coffee. Blackout coffee, yeah. To get 10% off your entire order, go to blackoutcoffee.com and use the code TGC. That's blackoutcoffee.com slash TGC and use the code TGC. In industry news this week, Walther has a new CEO. Rob McKenna, who was actually the president of the company, is now president and CEO as Adam Blaylock, the former CEO, moves to chairman of the board of the brand. Honestly, all this corporate structure bull makes my head spin. I don't understand it. So I'll just say congrats, and hopefully the company continues to grow and make cool stuff like they have been for a while. Moving on from there, a bit of news from a gun media outlet. Gun Talk Media has been around for a long time, and they just announced recently that they're creating a new facility where they can not only have a state-of-the-art content creation studio, but also a fully functional range. In fact, they plan to have a couple different ranges at their new facility, with the intent being hosting events and training and having people come by, as well as do their normal shooting for content. Duh. Gun Talk, in my opinion, is one of the few outlets that's managed to transition between radio, TV, and the online space very well. And this sort of proves that. You can't afford this kind of stuff if you suck at your job. Big shout out to Ryan Gresham, the president of Gun Talk and a friend of TGC for grabbing that new facility. Super exciting stuff for them. Can't wait to see it when it's done. And to cap off our industry news section, I'm going to attempt to answer a question that has come up a few times recently in our Gundamentalist Facebook group. A few folks wanted to know what is going on with SHOT this year and why brands were ejecting seemingly at the last minute. I don't know of any better time than right now to jump into this, so I'm going to try and break it down in a simple way. So for those that don't know, for those that are unaware, SHOT stands for Shooting, Hunting, and Outdoor Trades, and it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest, in the gun industry itself. It's a largely industry-specific show, and it's not open to the public, and it's a pretty big deal for gun brands or gun-adjacent brands, etc., anybody that operates in that space. SHOT is owned and operated by the NSSF, or National Shooting Sports Foundation. Okay, there's your sort of crash course. Now, the question at hand. There have been a bunch of brands deciding not to go to SHOT this year. SIG bailed months ago. And we've had some bigger brands like Beretta bail in the last 30 days or so as well. I've also heard from brands that are intending to have their booth set up, but not staffed at all. Or some are saying they're going to go and just walk around. Their booth isn't going to be there. Some are saying set up a booth, but walk around and not staff the booth. In certain ways, it sounds pretty dire. The entire time brands have been canceling, NSSF has said that they are all in on this year's show and that it's not an issue at all. They even at one point said that they have 35,000 attendees signed up. However, that's to be expected. That response is to be expected. I would be more scared if they were publicly worried about their own event not happening, right? So why would a brand think about bailing? Well, for starters, SHOT is a massive financial investment. It's absolutely massive. Smaller brands might end up spending in the neighborhood of seventy-five dollars to $100,000 on booth space, staffing, food, travel, and other incidentals that come up during the SHOT Show week. The big brands, sky's kind of the limit there, <laughs> SIG said in their press release about not going that they would be saving over a million dollars by not going. The cost of a booth, not the space, but the design and construction of a trade show booth alone is staggering. I mean, some of these are like two floor things. They look like cabins. They drag in tanks and this, and like, it's crazy. Then you add in the cost of the staff. That's expensive. People are expensive. You got to be paid, right? And then there's the mafia fees that come from the workers in the convention center. Companies have to pay people to set up their booths at all. So, like, they aren't allowed to do it themselves. If you want power, that's a different guy. Carpet, pay up, sucker. Also, 
you you wanted the carpet that wasn't paper thin and not crap. Oh, pay up for that. It's crazy how quickly that adds up. So it costs a ton of money, right? It just it's expensive. Well, that's that's great, but let's add in COVID and more specifically, one of the more, at least as they tell us, contagious variants, Omicron. Imagine if you show up with 10 people and one person gets sick and your team eats together, works together, and travels together for that week. Someone could be asymptomatic and get their entire crew sick by the time everyone gets home, and then you have to quarantine the entire team. And that's assuming you know it's happening. Imagine if someone got sick midweek and was like, I don't know, stuck in a hotel during the show. And then you've got to figure out how to get that person home. Now imagine a bigger brand that has multiple people get sick. And then there's the risk of getting people in the factory sick. If you bring it home, all of your family members, etc. It's bonkers. And the exposure risk of a convention like SHOT is massive. It's not about if you get sick, but rather when and with what. That's been the case for years. Lots of people get sick every year. And then you have the state and local mandates for health, like masks and social distancing and all that other nonsense. It's a huge headache on top of something that is already a big, it's just like a massive undertaking. Not only that, but I'm sure some brands were nervous that the NSSF would have to pull the plug at the last second and they would be stuck dealing with the fallout from that. Now, the other thing to consider is that SHOT has a points system for booth seniority. And a lot of brands that are still going are afraid to lose their position in line in terms of booth selection. No one wants to be jammed into the basement by the bathroom, so they're like, oh, we'll still have our booth, but we're not necessarily gonna be there so that we keep our points. That's something these brands are gonna have to consider. Another thing is that a lot of folks don't think SHOT is worth the investment on a normal year. It has changed, even in the short few years since my first show in 2013, it's evolved, and there are a lot of people that don't think it's even a necessary thing to spend money on. For us, as a media brand, it's a great spot to get a ton of coverage and networking handled in a short period of time, like everybody's in one room, that's great. But it's also the biggest headache and expense of our year. We spend well into five digits to make that work, and that's part of why we aren't going this year. I reached out to the NSSF for comments on this stuff, and they were unable to get back to me before the show started. So I assume that's probably because they're crazy busy, which is understandable. SHOT Show's huge, and that's what they care about right now. So there you have it. My thoughts, hopefully easy to follow, on why SHOT was a big question mark for a lot of brands this year. I, I know that there's still a lot going on. Obviously, we're covering stuff. So there it is. That's it. If you enjoyed this show and you want to see an ad-free version, check us out over on floatplane.com. We appreciate when you guys do that. And after you click the like button on this video, be sure to hit the secret affiliate link down in the description. Yeah, do that. That would be a massive help for us. And of course, don't forget to get subscribed for more gun news every single week. And as always, thank you all for watching. We'll see you soon. Yep, it's over, but don't worry. You can click on the video up top to watch last week's show. And the one below that is the one that YouTube thinks you'll enjoy. Check them out and let me know what you think.